So hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to the second day of the Zurich uh, workshop on quantitative macro uh, methods and, and models. So it is my uh, great honor to introduce our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Professor uh, Tom Sargent. So for all the macro economists or all the economists in the room, so Tom need no introduction. But my colleague uh, Felix Kubler, he wanted me to say a few. <laughs> <laughs> Introduction, introduction to, to Tom. So Tom is a professor of economics at NYU. So he's, you know, he's a Nobel Prize winner uh, in uh, 2011, uh, together with uh, uh, you know, his close friend and uh, co-author Chris Sims, who was also you know, my uh, committee member. So Tom is also a very important, personally Tom is a very important mentor to me. So when I was at the Princeton, so Tom visited us for a few times, and then we had a few very nice uh, breakfasts together, which inspired a few research projects of myself. So yeah, so thanks so much, Tom, for accepting our invitation. And uh, Tom will talk about uh, uh, macroeconomics after Lucas. You have one hour and 30 minutes, including the Q&A. OK, I won't use all the time. <coughs> OK. <laughs> so this is going to be a. Uh, I wrote this for this uh, sad occasion, a memorial event for Bob Lucas, and um, this paper was selected by uh, the organizers. The uh, other other paper had a bunch of equations on it, but but uh, the organizers didn't like those equations or something. So here, so here goes. Uh, okay, so this paper. Oh, I'm not. Oh, I'm using a different one. Okay, okay, okay. Th okay. Uh, sorry. Shoot. Okay. This p this paper is going to be a kind of a sequel to a uh, a, uh, a a paper I wrote with Lucas uh, called After Keynesian after Keynesian macroeconomics. Um, so I'm going to call this macroeconomics after Lucas. That's going to be the theme. Um, OK, so, so here's, here's Bob Lucas's rules for research. Um, he's going to use uh, constraints as guides. It's going to be very constrained. And his, the constraints that he imposed on his research are, are first to preserve quantitative successes of, of earlier theories. He's going to construct equilibrium stochastic processes. And he's going to make theory and econometrics fit together somehow. OK, so <coughs> in doing that, he's, he's uh, adhering to uh, Advice, although I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not aware that he ever looked at this. Um, there's a paper by Steven Weinberg, the great particle physicist, who um, wrote this paper, The Craft of Science, The Craft of Art. And what he says, <coughs> that, the, the, that the constraints that artists and theoretical physicists have to respect, how they make our, our craft, notice where he says our craft, difficult and how they make it possible. Every word counts there. Um, Weinberg says, often the most important constraint on a new theory is not, is not that it should survive this or that new experimental test. Every word counts. But it, that, that it should agree with the body of past observations as crystallized in, formal, in former theories. New theories must not throw out the successes of former theories. This sort of thing makes the work of the theorist far more conservative than is often thought. The world, the wonderful thing is that the need to preserve successes of the past is not only a constraint, but also a guide. OK, so <coughs> what are some of the successes that uh, Lucas insisted on preserving? Oh, by the way, in the body of this paper, um, this paper isn't written for you. Um, uh, it's written for, for uh, students, uh, new macro students who, who um, 
that I encounter who are who are reluctant perhaps to to learn things that were written before uh, you know 2018. Uh, I'm reflecting interactions with. Okay, and uh, okay, and the, the 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 reason there's a part of this paper. W one of the reasons that Lucas uh, achieved so much, uh, so much more than Friedman, was that. Um, he studied a lot when he when he he was a history major and and um, and when he started graduate school he knew zero economics, and um, what he did is he studied a bunch of things, and and what did what did he study, uh, just not randomly he studied things that Milton Friedman had had studied, who had, who had, who was very influential on Bob Lucas. Um, what had Friedman studied when he was in, in was a young, uh, math and statistics. Um, and in the p in my paper, I in I just summarized many of the things Friedman did in the in the 30s. His his uh, influential people on him were Hotelling and Wald. Hotelling is the inf uh, the inventor of what's called information geometry and so on. And uh, he wrote a number of papers. So so he was a he was state of the art in stochastic processes, uh, decision theory. That's what Friedman did. Where did he get his economics? He was, he was interested in um, sharp economics macro questions that had been posed by someone earlier, Irving Fisher. Okay, so what, what Lucas did is he learned everything Friedman did and then plussed. And as he learned more, he got more constraints and he got more guides. That's my paper. Um, okay, so... Here's some of the things, uh, successes Lucas insisted on preserving. Um, and many of these he got from Milton Friedman. Um, um, I'm tempted to talk about Neil Wallace now, too, who uh, played by a little different rule sometimes. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'm going to talk about Lucas. Uh, Cross-country and historical evidence about inflation that the quantity theory of money fit well. Apparent money supply non-neutralities. Sometimes it didn't fit well. Burns and Mitchell, NBER, reference cycle characterization of business cycles. Uh, that was an old-fashioned characterization. It, it, it persisted to this day. My other paper was about that. Um, okay. Um, Friedman Schwartz evidence pointing to monetary shocks as a source of business cycles. He, Lucas took that really seriously. I'm, I'll come back to that. Um, good fits of Klein Goldberger and other Keynesian macro models of U.S. business cycles. A lot of respect for Keynesian macro models. Evidence for expectations theories of the term structure of interest rate and stock prices. Those were in the air in the 60s, all of those things. Those are just some of them, and there's more. So here's constraints. So, so those, are, those, are, those are successes. He wants to write a macro model that, that uh, it's... Uh, as often, uh, the, it's going to fit those observations somehow. Somehow is a dubious word. Um, filtered through some models. Selected somehow. Okay. So his constraints that he imposed on his theories, um, and these are, these are, more s these are s stricter constraints than Milton Friedman imposed for various reasons. Um, he's going to populate his models with people, artificial people, who are optimizing decision theories, d decision makers. He's going to use an equilibrium concept to enforce coherence. And he's going to restrict the number of free parameters by imposing rational expectations. So he's going he's to live by that. And those are constraining. Okay, so now I, I'm going to, um, because that was my assignment f from Chicago t to talk about these, I'm going to talk about uh, the Keynesian revolution and the rational expectations revolution. And, um, and the way Lucas characterized those is there, there are, there are, there are revolu there's, there's revolutions in method that share almost everything in common. Okay. So... I'm just, oh, by the way, um, I don't. Here's the thing: don't waste your time reading my paper. Instead, 
um, read uh, and reread Lucas's uh, 1987 book, Models of Business Cycles. Um, read it and reread it. And I'm, I'm going to uh, quote from that extensively. Um, so, he, so here's, here's what, wh here's what uh, Lucas described the Keynesian revolution. And by the way, this is completely different than Skidelsky's book or than uh, you'll hear it described in many other places. Um, the Keynesian revolution was in the form in which it succeeded in the United States, not in Great Britain. A revolution in method. If one does not re uh, view the, ref the revolution in this way, it is impossible to account for mo some of its most important features. The evolution of macroeconomics <coughs> into a quantitative, scientific, he means empirical, discipline, the development of explicit statistical descriptions of economic behavior, not of variables, but of people, the increasing reliance of government officials on technical economic expertise, you know, at that time the Fed was building the Fed MIT model, there was the Wharton model, and the introduction of uh, the use of mathematical control theory to manage an economy, optimal control theory. That's what Gregory Chow and Timbergen and Tyler were wanting to do in the 50s for Keynesian models, for a noble purpose. They wanted to avoid another Great Depression, which was a disaster. Okay. It is the fact that Keynesian theory lent itself so readily, not by Keynes, but by others, um, Hicks, Modigliani, Oscar Lange, to the formulation of explicit econometric models which accounts for the dominant scientific position it attained by the 1960s. As a consequence of this, there is no hope of understanding either the success of the Keynesian revolution or its eventual failure at the purely v verbal level at which Keynes himself wrote. Don't read Keynes's general theory until you're five years older than I am. And you'll save yourself a lot of time and trouble. It will be necessary to know something of the way uh, macroeconometric models are constructed and the features they must have in order to work as aids in forecasting and policy evaluation. And then the rest, the next paragraphs dive into the formulation of stochastic systems of stochastic, multivariate stochastic difference equations. Okay. Okay. So what was the revolution in method that uh, Lucas is going to talk about? So how did he pull off the revolution? Uh, and it's going to be conservative. So, so the reason I put those is that, that's a statement of things he wants to preserve um, and successes he wants to preserve to confront failures that were present in an existing framework. Um, okay. So what are, his, what are his methods? And these are tools that Milton Friedman either didn't no, or didn't choose to use. And they're, they're tools that Lucas used. So, okay, so if you kind of ask, um, and, and um, you know, students ask, but we all do this. How are we going to do something new? It's, it's, uh, it's so, such a scary question, you don't, you don't, you don't want to think about it. So stop thinking about it. So then look at uh, something uh, that was successful in the past and stare at it and try to find its defects. And then if it was done by somebody else, somebody else that you respect, figure out, well, what did they do that was somehow defective? Okay, it's, it's tricky. So it's very conservative. So what are the tools that Lucas had? What was his ammo? And, and look at this. Um, so I'm not talking to you, or I'm not talking to people yesterday uh, who gave talks yesterday. I'm talking to my, I guess I'm talking to myself, well, why you should go learn some more math, Sergeant. And uh, I heard that at dinner the other night. Okay, so, uh, okay, fine. So what did he know? Markov processes. Markov decision problems. I'm going to call them MDPs. Markov decision problems. Uh, Sichersky and I have a, little book on dynamic program is all full of MDPs. Max Min separating hyperplane theorem. Rational expectations. 
come back to that, and what I'm going to call equilibrium Markov processes, culminating in equilibrium Markov process. <coughs> I'm going to define that. So what is an equilibrium Markov process? Okay, so this is distilling down about 10 pages, uh, 20 pages Lucas wrote in a couple of places. Okay, so, um, so what an equilibrium Markov process, it, it has these components. It's a coherent collection of Markov decision problems defined over a common state space. at you, okay? And then it's budget and resource constraints that somehow bind decision makers' Markov decision problems together. That's what I mean by an equilibrium Markov process. And I'm going to show you a bunch of examples. And Lucas created a bunch, and he basically taught us how to do this in a couple of ways. You know, the, the Stokey, Lucas, and Prescott book was circulating in the Manuscript versions of it were, they were starting around 76, 77, okay. Um, okay. Now what's true about those things is, <coughs> those are more constrained than some things that existed at the time. So every word, c things count. Markov, why restrict yourself to Markov? Uh, Uno's talk yesterday was touching on this, okay. So, equilibrium Markov processes, um, they, uh, they, what's the, the ra rational expectations plays a big role, big role. And I'm, I'm going to describe rational expectations um, as a form of communism. And what it does is it uh, builds in coherence. By the way, there's a paper uh, by Ben Mole that's circulating that... Um, The last section of this uh, is criticizing you guys, um, uh, you, um, and Nuno. Um, so, um, and you, because he's saying, like, like you're very talented and you're wasting your time trying to compute these equilibria, and you should be doing something else. And it, he, he wants to abandon, ra you know, uh, he's a friend of mine, and I've said this to his face. He wants to abandon rational expectations as if that's going to make thing your life easier. And I would say before you think it's going to make life easier, uh, think twice. We'll come back to that. Okay, so the whole point of rational expectations is it builds in coherence and it economizes on free parameters. And any machine learner wants to do that. That's what you guys were doing yesterday. Uh, that was making what was making it go. Uh, so um, any time anybody says surrender rational expectations, so economize less on free parameters and uh, don't build in coherence that way, you've got to ask them a couple of questions. How do I build in coherence? And uh, how do I handle the extra parameters? Okay, so rational expectations. So I'm going to uh, describe how ra uh, Lucas described rational expectations. Okay, so now lots of people describe it in ways, I'll just tell you. Um, um, okay, so I went to this conference at Chicago with this, and it was in honor of his, me of his memory, and a bunch of his students got up, and they talked about what a nice guy Lucas was all the, all the time. And they, uh, it was, fil uh, Lucas liked to filter, it was a lot of filtering, it, what a nice guy and how happy he made them f feel. Well, <coughs> he was, okay, he, he was a nice guy, but he was also a very critical guy. He was very critical. And he made a lot of people feel unhappy, including his colleagues and his students. Okay, so one thing that made him unhappy was some things some of your colleagues have said over and over, how they define rational expectations. Okay, um, yeah, you. <laughs> okay, I don't want, okay, so, uh, so, so here's, uh, one of the things that really annoyed him was how people explain rational expectations to the masses. Okay, so here's, here's models of business cycles. The, the term rational expectation, as Muth used it, that's how he wants to use it, refers to a consistency axiom for economic models. You could stop there. 
It's a consistency axiom for economic models. So it can be given a precise meaning only in the context of specific models. Stop there. I think this is why attempts to define rational expectations in a model-free way tend to come out either vacuous, people do the best they can with the information they have, or silly, people know the true structure of the world they live in. What people, um, yeah, so then he, that's not what rational expectations is, and it's silly. Uh, what people refer to as the rational expectations revolution in macroeconomics is mainly the manifestation in one field of application of a development that is affecting all fields of application. Okay, equilibrium Markov processes. Okay, so and I want to talk about rational expectations. And I'm going to talk about it kind of my way, but that's it. So what's a model? What's a statistical? What's a, what's a statistical model? What a statistical? Every everything that's been talked about in this. I'm not talking to you because everything we saw yesterday was a statistical model, or or, or a, a statistical model is it's a a probability distribution over a vector could be an inference from vector indexed by some parameters. That's one model. It's a joint probability distribution. Stochastic process is an example. That's one. A manifold of models is let the vector of parameters live in some space, big theta, and now you sweep out a manifold of models. That's a model. Uh, that's a, that's a, a suite of models. Okay. So what rational expectations theorizing does is it is imposes communism, communisms at various levels. And all I mean by that is sharing statistical models. Okay, so in, with rational expectations theorizing and econometrics, so rational expectations automatically carry some econometrics with it. Remember what I said, uh, Lucas's rules. Now, did he always play by his rules? That's what we have to watch for. So he was critical. Uh, did he? So that's what we want to watch for. So rational expectation theory, th there, the decision makers inside a model share a vector stochastic process with each other and with the theorist who built the model. That's a mouthful. There's a bunch of people, and there's, and there's the model builder. The statistical process is, is going to be, in, you know, it's, it's affected by what the decision makers do. There's this coherent collection of Markov decision problems. There's an equilibrium. At the end of the day, the output is a, the output of all that theory, theorizing is a Markov equilibrium model, Markov equilibrium process. Okay, so so there's a lot of sharing goes on. The sharing is extended by rational expectations econometrics. That's just theorizing. That's ju that's just math. So Lucas's beautiful 1972 Jet paper. So rational expectations econometrics. By the way, this is not Arrow and Debreu. This is not Arrow's theory of value. And we'll come back to that. It's not inconsistent with that. Yeah. Yeah. Please. I'm, I'm going to avoid the word true. Okay, yeah. Can you see me without working here? Yes. <laughs> Eventually. Okay. <laughs> we'll come back to that. That's a key question. That's a key question. That's a key question. Okay? We'll come back to that. Yeah. No, just, just, just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Okay. <laughs> So what's rational expectations econometrics? Th this is the second. Here, the econometrician and nature also share the model. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. 
Okay. So Tony Smith is back there, okay? So, okay. Sharing with nature is an input into making maximum likelihood or GMM a good estimator. So if you ask, so if you ask, um, you could say, those guys in Minnesota, they're not communists. You know, of course, but they are. When Hansen did GMM, look where he uses communism and to whom he imputes communism. Just look at it inside the model, okay? So he's going to do that. So that's just logic. Now, where does this come from? Okay, where does this come from? Okay, so John Lucas' question is, the theorizing is just, that's math, okay? Uh, now, when you come to, uh, uh, that's Lucas's jet paper. When his AER paper, he goes to the second, has to go to the second step. And he does something that came up yesterday with uh, various points, starting with Virgilio's um, talk about information projection. We'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. And uh, John Lucas' question is going to haunt us. And it haunted Lucas um, and Prescott. Okay. So, um, so, so I'm just going to say a bunch of things. So um, the following. Uh, 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 rational expectations, uh, the theory, just the theory, it brings some beautiful, um, the sharing brings some beautiful uh, things because uh, in, a, in a rational expectations model, the same object plays multiple roles. The same object plays multiple roles. So, so an equilibrium conditional distribution for prices, okay? That comes out of a rational expectations model, like f several versions yesterday. Okay, okay, what is that? Well, it's part of a mark, it's part of a uh, equilibrium Markov process, period. Now exactly what is it and who owns it? Okay, so what it is, uh, it could be a, um, a decision rule for a central banker to which the decision rule, uh, to which the decision makers choose to conform within the equilibrium. That's one thing it is. So it's owned by the guys uh, Nuno works for, They're the central bank. Or it's also the f optimal forecasting rule of everybody who wants to forecast prices in the model. It's their forecasting rule. It's the agent's optimal forecasting rules, and so on. So there's this beautiful paper by Chang, uh, 1998, which is a model of credible policy. And in his model, he has a variable theta t. It's a scalar. This is a beautiful model that I recommend highly. So in that model, theta t, that same variable plays multiple roles. It's like a play in which the same actor comes in, pl just playing different things, but different n you know, names. Like, 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 like Poincaré said, the art of mathematics is to give the same name to a whole bunch of different things. So this is... Poincaré raised to the fifth. So what it, if theta is, it's the Ramsey planner's promised inflation rate. This occurred in Nuno's talk yesterday. It's the Ramsey planner's inflation target. Nuno's bosses would love that. It's the public's expected rate of inflation, and it's the actual rate of inflation. And now you ask, who chooses it? Or in language that I don't like, what causes it? Who chooses it? And what do you mean by choice? Okay, so rational expectations ties you into that. Um, okay, so um, so this feature actually, uh, there's a, a book by uh, called The Art and Science. I like the title of Central Banking by Alan Blinder in 1998. And uh, I'll, this, this book, he, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. He, he, he had just retired as uh, head of the, uh, as vice chairman of the Fed, and he was a candidate to be chairman of the Fed. So, so he has to be, okay, so what he talks about is Kidlin and Prescott, and he says he hates it, okay? And he says he's not going to talk about it anymore. Tells you why he hates it in chapter one. The rest of the book, he keeps coming back and talking about it. Okay, okay, so... And, 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 and he understands it. Okay, so if you go to the last chapter, 
he, ha he's, he's, a, he's not talking about Kidlin Prescott anymore, but he says the following, I come into a Fed meeting, I come into the Fed meeting, and we're going to set rates. And he said, what happens over and over again, I come in and my colleagues say, we can't disappoint the market because the market's expecting us to do this. And then he has a big argument there why he's, so here's what he says. He says, I don't believe it. I think the market's great uh, most of the time. You know, I think stock, and he says a whole bunch of things. I think market prices are right. Remember, he wants to get appointed to be head of the Fed. But I think he sincerely, he think, but he says, I don't think it's always right. And he says, uh, so I don't think as a principle we should say we shouldn't disappoint the market. But I think we usually should not disappoint the market. That's what he says. Well, Calvo's hitting him over the head. You know, he's wrestling with the same thing. So he, he comes in and he's not free to choose. And that's true in a, in a, in a stoky, credible economic policy. The whole thing is, that's as communism is coming back. So it's, it's real. Um, okay, causation. Um, okay, so here's the following thing. Uh, that's a very popular word, a word now in big parts of, uh, of uh, economics. Um, and here's the kind of thing that you want to uh, kind of think about that, again, I'm talking to, undergraduate, uh, to first year graduate students at the place where I work and other places, so maybe, so, okay, who want to do causal inference. I don't want to learn dynamic programming because I don't need it. I just need to run a regression and I get big data set. Uh, and I'm, okay, and I'll do, uh, I'm gonna, uh, okay, identify, okay. Um, so, um, so what you'll notice is Lucas rarely used the word cause. Uh, Koopmans, Marshak, Hurwitz rarely used the word cause. Milton Friedman rarely used the word cause. And why? Because they were thought of the economy as uh, consisting of some kind of equilibrium that was a system of simultaneous stochastic difference equations where there's, there's a bunch of simultaneous equations that are being caused, that, shit, that are be <laughs> being solved, being solved somehow, somehow. Okay, um, you, you, you see, you have to be careful who you hang around. Um, okay, so, so, so simultaneous, simultaneity across decisions, times, and chances make model builders cautious to say anything about cause or effect. Okay, nevertheless, here's the thing. Inside an equilibrium Markov model, all the little people living there have very definite ideas of cause and effect. They say cause and effect, and they have to. So there's causations. There's causations precisely defined. So let's say, what is a well-posed Markov decision problem? So it has some components. It's got, it's got vectors of states and controls or decisions. This is right out of Bert Sikas or it may, may not be Lucas and Stokey and Lucas's languages, but it's there. There's a vector of states and there's a vector of controls or decisions. And what there is is there's a, there's a state space and there's a partition of the state space into controllable and uncontrollable subspaces. Okay, so there's this space. And so this is, this is Leuenberger language <laughs> in control theory. Remember, Lucas in, this, in the s 60s, he knew more control theory than anybody he'd met until he met Prescott, okay? And they know this language, okay? So, so if you partition a state space into controllable and uncontrollable sets, that's a theory of causes and effects because the stuff you jiggle, you're affecting the controllable subspace and you're not affecting the uncontrollable subspace. So that goes with the territory, but so an, a Markov decision problem describes how uh, decisions of, a, of a, a little guy inside the model uh, shapes trajectories through a controllable subspace, okay? But then the beautiful thing, the MDP, Markov, it also implies a joint probability density. I'm in, I'm in continuous state space. 
over the uncontrollable subspace. And so it has a, an associated theory of optimal prediction. So, so Lucas liked to talk about the certainty equivalence principle that, that, that Tile and Simon discovered for linear quadratic models and how that has a sharp distinction between these two, okay, that persists. So, okay. So, Hurwitz talked about uh, causality that a policymaker might make, and it's the same, might use, and it's the same one, uh, he was very reluctant, but what it was about invariance. What the policymaker needs to know is parameters that are going to be invariant with respect to uh, their experiments he wants to do. And that goes beyond what the little guys inside the model have to do. That's it. Okay. So now I'm just going to give you examples of equilibrium Markov processes. Remember, um, my theme is uh, macroeconomics after Lucas. So I'm just going to make an, an, a, a list. So this is people. Yesterday, we saw some beautiful examples pushing the frontier in this. So representative uh, agent recursive competitive equilibrium models, big K, little k distinctions. Uh, Markov perfect equilibria. Uh, that's in the first chapter one of that book I, by Lucas. Uh, Ramsey, also known as Stackelberg equilibria. That's what Nuno was talking about yesterday. Um, state variables of Stackelberg leader include the followers continuation values. So that leads, so that's a, got a, a Bellman equation has a value function from another Bellman equation inside. Why not stop, why stop there? Okay, so that leads to what I like to call dynamic programming squared. This has not caught on. I'm, I'm the only person who says that. But there, the value function of a Stackelberg leader has, uh, they have arguments that include followers value functions. And people have exploited that. A credible public policies. Um, there's an abru, you know, lots of things that uh, some people think are new, are as old as the hills. Uh, credi uh, what they call sequence space method. That abru Stokey formulation of credible policies. It's awful to work with. It's just awful to work with. Uh, read a group's paper and read Stokey's first paper, and then read her second paper. Uh, Chang, Fail, and Stichetti. A Bru Pearson Sicchetti formulations of credible policies. Those are mark there's those are Markov equilibrium models. Keep going. Atkinson Lucas models of redistribution dynamics. Uh, there the state includes a joint cross section distribution of continuation values. It's a massive object. And a key object in the analysis is what's called um, some people call it a push forward opera a T. The optimal transport guys call it a push-forward operator. It's really just a Markov operator. It ma it's a, it's a one-step Markov operator. That's mapping a big Markov. It maps a cross-section at T into a cross-section at T plus 1. Uh, optimal transportation, Kentorovich. Mean field games, these are connected. There, cross-section distributions are states. Mean field games are just an extension of of uh, Lucas Prescott, big K, little k models. Uh, single agent, robust decision problems. Uh, there, there's a Markov decision problem inside every person's individual agent's head. There's a civil war inside every soul because you distrust your model. And, and there's, that's, so is that hairy, fairy stuff? No, adversarial control and actor-critic models, so it's used all over. Okay, so. Okay, keep going. So now I'm gonna talk about rational expectations and government policies. And this occurred in a couple of models. So rational expectations and, uh, and getting Ramsey plans, doing optimal government policies. Um, so, uh, Th this uh, is going to be a huge, massive reliance on rational expectations, communism. Massive. Um, and uh, various people think it's incredible. Uh, Chris Sims, starting at number one. And he calls it 
utopian. And uh, uto that's a dirty word, because uh, 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 Lucas, uh, go read uh, the, the Republic, and uh, look what the, uh, it's a reference to the first, the first utopia, the Republic, and the optimal state uh, designed by Plato. It's horrible. It's Sparta. And so, so the word among philosophers, the word utopian is, it's a slur. So Sims and Lucas, who are well-read, uh, Sims said that Lucas' whole program was utopian. Um, and Lucas got the point. It's a nasty remark. Okay. So, um, so, what, so what ki what's kind of going on? What's the Ramsey planner doing? He's evaluating choices and outcomes along many historically unprecedented paths, completely unprecedented. So he's comparing uh, different Markov equilibrium processes. Uh, and somehow, he thinks, he or th she thinks they know the, the parameters that allows them to do counterfactuals that are alternative equilibrium Markov processes. So the, so the Ramsey planner assumes a joint, common joint distribution as he searches across alternative joint probability distribution. So every time he changes the model, he's bringing along everybody. And, and, and so look, all the cross equation restrictions are rational. So if you were doing this, um, you utopian. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so, uh, so this is much more restrictive. This is gonna re relate to, the, this is more restrictive to, to self-confirming equilibria. There's a, there's a weaker equilibrium concept. So there's, in which decision ma makers th uh, share joint densities only over events that occur infinitely often within the equilibrium. That's a mouthful. They share joint, uh, uh, marginal joint probability distribution only over events that occur infinitely often um, in the equilibrium. Now why do I say infinitely often? Or does that ring a bell? So if you want to prove that you could learn something about anything and you want to apply a central limit, uh, uh, a law of large numbers, you're going to have to have uh, enough observations. And if you don't have, uh, if you don't see uh, conditional events, events uh, enough of ev the events long enough, you cannot learn about them. You can't revive, nobody can, nobody can. So that has, this has implications about learning about irrational expectations of equilibrium. So there's a literature, uh, Albert Marcet, uh, and I participated in this early on, and, and this, um, I won't say anything more about somebody <laughs> now. Okay, um, so uh, there's a literature on uh, learning uh, conditions under which learning about part of a, uh, you, you, here's what you do. You replace, and uh, Ben Mole has to listen up on this. You replace the, uh, the, the agents who are rational within a, within a rational, the, the, you replace some of the agents within a Markov decision problem with agents who don't know everything. And in particular, they don't know the uh, laws of motion of the uncontrollable things that they want to forecast. They don't know that. But what they do is they have a least squares regression program or a nonlinear regression, and they just regress, okay? And then under certain circumstances, uh, uh, and, and their learning disrupts the equilibrium. Okay, so where does that system go? That's, a, that's an equilibrium, that's a system which you have non-rational agents, and they're learning along the way. They're doing least squares, and they're not Bayesian learners because they, they don't know enough to be Bayesians because they, they don't know that they're learning about a shooting target, which they're disrupting. But there's adaptive control, and it uses techniques. Guess what? F one of the f first people to write papers on this were Hotelling and Milton Friedman about how do you maximize a function which you don't know. And, and they invented the first step towards stochastic approximation, a Columbia project, pro which you were using yesterday. You guys were using yesterday. And that's why your thing was working. Okay, so you do that. It, con it ends up converging to irrational expectations of equilibrium at some rate. Okay, Tony Smith exploited that. 
in Crusell Smith. That idea is in there in Crusell Smith. Anyway, what that will converge, but it will not converge to a, a full rational expectations equilibrium because they'll figure things out along the equilibrium path, but things that don't occur, they won't know. So this goes to something that's called a self-confirming equilibrium, which is different from a rational expectations equilibrium along certain dimensions. And particularly, it's different in the following way. People have correct beliefs about things that occur infinitely often. They can be completely awe crazy about things that are historically unprecedented. Historically means along their path. So that sounds really geeky, right? But uh, <laughs> this, this la lays uh, room for the following thing. You can have two models, the policymaker's model and God's model that agree along the equilibrium path and the policymaker's model is completely wrong about things off the equilibrium path. Those beliefs influence what it does along the equilibrium path. So there's a literature on, on uh, policy making in self-confirming equilibria. Okay. So uh, this bears on the foundations of, uh, the empirical foundations of rational expectations. Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay, so, now, so I'll just say that. Okay, so now I'm just going to keep going. Um, impulse response functions. How would you say? Uh, Lucas didn't like them. Why? So he says, here's what he says. Uh, you know, one cannot usefully think about economic policy, about the strategies of government, of the government. Another player in this game, that's the game he talks about, was a Markov, an equilibrium Markov, right? in terms of current policy decisions only. Private agents necessarily have to make inferences about the way monetary, future monetary fiscal policy would be conducted. If we discuss policy as though it involved only what government does today, that is, if we discuss policy in terms that dominates current political discussion, then we are leaving the most important aspects of policy undiscussed and their consequences unanalyzed. And he means that. So, so what, now let's talk about impulse response functions. Every equilibrium Markov process, it carries an associated nonlinear vector impulse response functions. It's got it with it. You had them yesterday. Um, so those record transient and during responses to, respo to surprises within an equilibrium. What are they good for? So, so I, here's what. So there's narrow uses. Lucas would be less diplomatic. He'd say boring or useless uses of impulse responses. For fixed impulse response functions, that means we're not, we're not going to disrupt the equilibrium, and he wanted to disrupt it. And Sim says you're dreaming if you think you sh should disrupt it, and you're utopian if you want to. So big things are involved there. They study how responses to shocks unfold. Jen had a really creative idea about uh, rest restricting what you mean by shocks. That's Quite interesting. Um, so those are that, that what that's invent studies about quantitative easing. There's hundreds of those, and read Bernanke's book if you want. 21st century monetary policy, uh, central banking. It's all about those. Um, so nonlinearities can make responses to large and small shocks differ. Okay, so. They're of limited use in, in designing improved policies because surprises can't be systematically chosen ex ante. Okay, Jen Jenner is playing on this. What do you mean by ex ante? Who's ex ante? And some some can be, but they're real. Her surprises are very subtle. I'll just say that. So they can never let. Oh, by the way, they can nevertheless be uh, useful. Uh, as Gallant, Tauk, and Auxiliary models for constructing moments for GMM estimators of free parameters of equilibrium Markov processes. This is a way of doing, Tony Smith wrote a uh, really important and early paper on this, uh, indirect inference. We'll come back to that. So here's ambitious, there are ambitious uses of uh, impulse response functions. Uh, so with your paper, uh, another paper. You can characterize equilibrium impulse response functions as functionals 
of parameterized government policy rules. And you have to do that to uh, solve dynamic Ramsey and Mirrorlease problems. You're doing it. Okay. So now I talk about rational expectations and econometrics. So, um, so, okay. Lucas was opinionated but not dogmatic, and he was willing to change his mind and struggle with hard issues. Um, so, so he here's the following. Um, this, remember, Steven Weinberg, constraints are guides. I keep thinking Carolyn, my wife. Okay, our guides. Um, are they always, do you always like them? Okay, so what an equilibrium Markov process does, it induces a joint probability distribution over sequences of prices, quantities, information sets indexed by a vector of parameters. In other words, a statistical model. I'm repeating myself. So now you just think, blah, 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 that's the definition. Does that remind you of anything? It's a, s a synonym for an equilibrium is a likelihood function. An equilibrium is a likelihood function. Read the first thing, that's a likelihood function. You just flip, you just flip, okay? You with me? Constraints as guides. How should you make, if you, now, if you trust your model, how should you, and you think you, you want to do econometrics, so you want to share your model with nature, how should you do econometrics? Your hands are tied. You do rational expectations econometrics. That's kind of the road. So, so there's two varieties. You pretend to be a frequentist, and you use maximum likelihood to infer parameters, or you pretend to be a Bayesian, and you put a prior over a parameter vector, you form a joint probability distribution, and you use inverse probability to compute approximate posteriors. Uh, that's Dynair. Okay. So, think about, now, this revolution, rational expectations revolution, uh, was conservative in the following thing. So the, the theme is, look how much Lucas respected of what went before. It shares the purposes and the object of interest with Kuhlmann's, Marshak, Hurwitz, Coles Commission approach. You know, and, um, you know, they should, be, they should be celebrated at Chicago, but they were driven out of Chicago, so they, should, they are celebrated at Yale. And they should be read today. You should read Sh Marshak and, and uh, again, I'm not talking to you. Well, I, I'm t if you haven't read, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to a, a guy, you know, NYU guy. I'm not going to read anything before 2015. 2000, I'm certainly not going to read anything. Yeah. And, uh, well, why don't you go read Koopman's 1947? You want to see how to write a paper or you want to see how to think? Uh, I tried that out. didn't work. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what's the shared object of interest? The shared object, of, it's a system of simultaneous stochastic difference equations with reduced form parameters in front of a whole bunch of people. Don't say reduced form unless you mean this. Reduced form parameters that are functions of deeper parameters that govern aspects of behavior invariant to a range of possible policy interventions. That's what Marshak and Kubans meant. That's what they meant. Lucas didn't invent that. And they share with R.A. Fisher, this is another thing that annoyed, annoyed Lucas, identification, okay? There's an old definition of, of identification. It's over 100 years old. It's R.A. Fisher's. Parameter identification. What do you mean by parameter, parameter identification? It's a statement about information. Information about what? A parameter. There's an information matrix about parameters. And what it is, it's a condition number. Sorry, Felix. It's a condition number of a Hessian of the log likelihood function evaluated at parameter values that maximize the log likelihood function. And if, if that condition number is, is uh, I have dyslexia, low, you're in good shape. If it's high, uh, you should worry. If it's infinite, uh, okay. So, so it shares all those things. So what's the difference? It, and hi here comes the revolution part. A rational expectations equilibrium, a Markov it disrupts, it, it subverts the Coles Commission exclusion restrictions. They had ways of getting that Hessian to be a full rank. And, uh, 
And if you stare at it um, on equilibrium Markov process, it violates all of them. It's like, it's not like there's no exclusion. Every, everything is, everything that's in the demand, quote unquote demand function is also in the supply function because they're information variables. Um, but uh, they substitute something else and it's via a, a stack Bellman equation that they impose extensive cross equation and cross frequency restrictions across equilibrium decision rules and agent specific, I'll quit soon, uh, uh, conditional probability densities for agent specific uncontrollable state variables. That's a mouthful. But those are objects that appear within an equilibrium model. Uh, they appeared within all the models yesterday. Okay. So language police. Uh, yes, uh, when you say compute, I hear approximate. Same thing. So now, when you say I'm going to compute an equilibrium, you're approximating equilibrium. I got this from Felix and his pals. Okay. So there's an intimate relationship between equilibrium computation and learning. We saw some of this yesterday. When you compute, how are you going to compute an equilibrium? You know, what do you what are you going to um, what what tool are you going to use? Um, Newton, or something, or um, there's better thing that's that's a, uh, yeah. There's a accelerated uh, Nemiroff accelerated descent. Okay, there's there's ways you can accelerate, but it's variations of Newton's law. They ring a bell. Um, what kind of governs least squares learning? Newton. Okay, so uh, so you want to compute a fixed point. Uh, of, a, of, a, of a mapping from a perceived law of motion to an equilibrium. So there's connections between equilibrium computation algorithms and non-rational expectations models in which agents learn about laws of motion and maybe price functions too. What do they learn? Well, if you say, I'm going to have agents don't know all the stuff they know within a Markov uh, equilibrium process, you've got to say, what don't they know? And uh, so this is, I'm talking to Ben Maul, you know, who can take it. He, can, he dishes it out so he can take it. He better be able to take it. So learning. Now, now one, okay, this, so th I'm talking to Ma Ben Ma now. Okay. So who's learning and what, they're lear what are they learning about? So, so you can learn within a rational expectation. You can learn about. There's a whole literature about this. People, people have done this. And uh, in both in game theory and macro, and a lot of them have come back wounded. I'll just say that. And read Lars Hansen's Nobel lecture. Okay. And I, th I think I'll quit. Okay, so, so here's the following. And this was a theme. This, this occurred yesterday. Okay. Uh, it's a during theme. Approximating models. Lucas agreed with Copernicus. So we're in Zurich, so this occurs to you. Uh, and here's Steven Weinberg. That a simple and beautiful theory that agrees with observation is often closer to the truth than a complicated, ugly theory that agrees better with a proc observation. Okay, so since I want John Lucas uh, from Italy, and uh, there was the Inquisition there, and you could get in trouble by saying, advancing a theory and just saying, this is an approximation, and it's a good approximation of data, Inquisition wouldn't touch you. But if you said this is the truth, they'd burn you at the stake. So be careful. <laughs> okay. So now look at the following. So Lucas did that. He lived by that. But now look at the following. Uh, now, g g guess what? So Copernicus's model, I'm just going to tell you. Okay, so we could do So actually, Copernicus's model was worse than the model, empirically, than the model they criticized. It didn't fit at all as well as Ptolemy's model. It was, okay. It would, get, it would not get published by Econometrica. It, it just got blown out of the water. And Kepler's model was no better. So, uh, and and uh, Ptolemy was fitting Fourier transforms. You know, he was doing deep learning uh, well. You know, he had, he had that's, what, you know, that's what these circles are. Okay, and they fit well. So what did Copernicus do? I said, I'm gonna have a model with many fewer parameters and it's closer to the truth. Well, okay, can't, I burn, you know, flames, you know, but he didn't say it's a better approximation. 
Anyway, okay, so anyway. So I'll s now we get into, uh, there's a collision. That a simple and beautiful model that agrees well with observation is often closer to the truth than a complicated, ugly theory. And by the way, Lucas, I heard him say somebody's theory was ugly. I heard him say a whole bunch of times. He never said it to them. He didn't, he said it after a couple of beers. And, and I remember who they were. <laughs> Sometimes me. <laughs> okay. But he would say that. He would say beauty and ugly all the time. Um, and uh, you'd say, but you say, but Bob, look, my, my likelihood ratio statistics is much better than that other model. <laughs> that didn't do it for him. Okay. So that collides with rational expectations and kind of metrics. So then this is going to get to Duke. So I don't want to get burned on the stake, but both Bayesian and frequentist statisticians, they assume a correct likelihood function. Just look what they're doing. Just look what's justifying their procedures. So they, I hate to say this, they know a truth in the form of a manifold, a they know a manifold of parameters, joint pro distributions. They just don't know the values. They know exactly. They just don't know the values. So there could be another manifold out there. If we had more time, we'd talk about that. So regarding an, uh, an equilibrium uh, model as a, uh, as a likelihood function, a as an approximation to an unspecified better model, forces a model builder to think about inferences and decision making in the presence of misspecified statistical models. You're forced into la the land of ambiguity and robustness. Okay, so Lucas thought about this and he had things to say. And actually, read, these pa read page 71 because it bears on yesterday on how people were picking shocks. It bared on Virgilio and, and um, John Lucas' papers. And he, cri and he criticized Kidlin Prescott a big time. Um, Lucas was the master of the double entendre. He can, he can seem to praise you, but read it carefully and think a couple times. Second and third reading, he's criticized you. Uh, so he, look what he says. He's, he's praising the Lucas and uh, the Kittle and Prescott model. He celebrates it sincerely. He, he thought it was a great model. So he says, Kittle and Prescott do not say much about which questions they hope their model could simulate accurately or with what level of accuracy. And he says, whether Kittle and Prescott's uh, results are viewed as good or bad is a difficult question as is the related question of which comp comparisons of theoretical to sample moments are most interesting. That's a puzzling question if, if you're Tony Smith or, or uh, Rational Expectations Econometrics. You say, what do you mean? Uh, read Smith first and then read Galant and Talkin and they nail it. They tell you. He, has something that he said, one could obtain a formal start. He said, I know this sharpening of these questions by using the discipline of classical hypothesis testing. Now, re read this and th think about it. That's why I say read this book and uh, read it. I've been reading it for 40 years. But the interesting question raised by the Kidlin and Prescott model is surely not whether it can be accepted as true when nested... S see, he doesn't want to get burned at the stake either. Uh, when uh, nested within some broader class of models... Um, He's making fun of Lars Hansen and me there in those days. Um, of course the model is not true. This much is evident from the axioms on which it is constructed. We know from the outset in an enterprise like this, and he would say in any effort in positive economics, that what will emerge as at best uh, is a workable approximation that is in useful in answering a useful limited set of questions. And he said, Kittle and Prescott didn't say what questions. So... He, this is in the thing where he's praising him. And then he says something else. It, it, it'll go by really fast. He says how, and it's related to, to a couple talks yesterday, how did Kittle and Prescott choose their, st their shock processes? They only have the one key shock. It's the technology shock. It's what? And he, so he, Lucas has a section where he says, the great thing is Kittle and Prescott can do micro. They can use micro evidence and import it. So they can import a bunch of parameters from extraneous studies, and, and lock them and put them in. And then he says, oh, guess what? Keelan and Prescott didn't do that for the solo, the key solo shock process. They didn't, they didn't take solos things. What they did is they did it themselves. They, they did their, and what they did is they raised the variance of the, of the technology shock, you know, many times what solo found. And then th that made their model 
work, fit. Now, was this going on yesterday? And, and uh, there was an exchange between uh, Tony and John Luca yesterday, which was about this. And it was, uh, both sides were, and it's kind of about information projection. So then Lucas goes on to say, he says, you need another shock. Okay, he, he does this in a different chapter because he doesn't want you to think that he's totally, he's not negative. He, he, and he says, you need another shock, a monetary shock. And you're going to need that. And that he's basically saying, when Kidlin and Prescott picked their shock, they were attributing too much to it. The monetary shock was doing something and they were missing stuff. So now what this is, here's what this is. So, okay, this is what I want to talk about. This is what I want. Here's one ball, here's one manifold of models, and here's another mon manifold. This is the mon manifold Lucas wants, the monetary model, and here's Kidlin and Prescott's. They do this. Well, if you take a model here and you project it here, what do you get? And that's a question people talk about, information projection. It's going on in your talk, too. Anyway. So, look. Okay, let's talk about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit now. I'm just going to say, okay. Okay, so one, one thing. I'm just going to say one thing. So, I'm just going to conclude. Here's the last section of this paper, which is the fun thing. Um, so, <laughs> this is where you think Luke, Lucas was a fun guy and made everybody happy, feeling good everywhere. Okay. <laughs> So here's, Lucas was opinionated. I'm going to tell you some of his opinion opinions. Um, so I list a bunch of them. Oh, and I want to, I want to save, I want to save three minutes at the, at the end. So price rigidities. So read this. The, the term rigidity does not refer to some characteristic of nominal price and wage series by themselves. It's not about that. And everybody, you played by Lucas's rules here. It's rather the behavior of these series relative to the way they would have been predicted to behave under a particular class of models. So you're playing by those rules. He says the problem with price rigidities is that they seem to come and go. Sometimes monetary changes that ought to be pure units changes seem to be just that. Sometimes they seem to have large non-neutral effects. Virgilius paper is about that. Now let's say I got some other things. Sticky prices, okay. So he liked models in which Chum's church, he liked models like yours. Whether he'd like your particular model, I, he would like this along some dimensions. Okay, just gonna say, macro labor. I'm just gonna say something about macro labor. He had opinions about this. So here's the short version. Lucas preferred models of aggregate wages and interest rates and employment without jobs, no jobs. No jobs at all. And there's a quote where he says it. He preferred models of unemployment with jobs. Quotes about that. So read what he says. So f unemployment and business cycles, what he thought, he, that's what he said. Um, I'm the messenger. Don't. From the point of view of modeling aggregate employment, aggregate inflation, interest rates, and GDP and its composition, modeling flows into and out of unemployment to sideshow. That's what he thought. So, let me say a couple. Let me say just a couple of things. That's kind of a mystery, because um, you know it's very sad. Like, you know, th within the last more or less year, both Bob Lucas died and Robert Solo died. Okay. <laughs> so here's something that that uh, that's always puzzled me, because uh, in addition to Milton Friedman, uh, Lucas re really respected Solo and Samuelson tremendously. And he copied them. So, so, here's in the, in the, here, so here's what I'm going to say. So this has puzzled me the following. Um, you know, Larry Summers uh, has written that uh, Lucas was just completely misleading. Don't, don't, don't. He's written, don't do it. Equilibrium Markov process, if you need that, you're a dope. Okay, um, fine. But Solo also said it. Okay, and here's what Solo said. Um, Read it. He said, see, he, read, he, he wrote this discussing a paper by Lucas. He says, deep down, I really wish I could believe that Lucas is right. Because the one thing I know how to do well is equilibrium economics. The trouble is, I feel so embarrassed at saying things that I know are not true. He said, it is, as, it is plain 
as the nose on my face that the labor market and many markets for produced goods do not clear in any many meaningful sense. That's Robert Solow. <coughs> so what was Solow ex uh, um, upset about? Because Lucas had written these words, okay, uh, trying to explain why he used cleared markets. So he says, in recent years, the meaning of the term equilibrium, he, this is 1978, has changed so dramatically that a theorist of the 30s would not recognize it. An economy following a multivariate stochastic process is now routinely described as being in equilibrium by which is meant nothing more than at each point in time, A, markets clear, and B, agents act in their self-interest, are satisfied. This development, which stemmed mainly from work by Arrow and De Bruyne, 64 and 59, implies that simply to look at any economic time series and conclude that it is a disequilibrium phenomenon is a meaningless observation. Indeed, a more likely conjecture on the basis of work by Sonenshine, 1973, is that the general e hypothesis that a collection of time series describes an economy in competitive equilibrium is without content. So think about that. So, so then, so how do you proceed? Okay, so now, th th this loops back when I said these equilibrium mark are not, they are very, very special cases of Aaron de Bru which did not have rational expectations. They don't even have separations between, they don't even have expected utility. They don't have that, they're more general. So, so here's the thing, equilibrium Markov processes inquire content only by, Yale is really important in this, by imposing more st restrictions on quant prices and quantities than Sonenshine and Shine had. So Lucas isn't the only one to think about Sonenshine. and Shine, uh, people at Yale did. Uh, so, 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 how do how do we get those restrictions? So, so, so over many years, Stokey, Lucas, and Prescott—that's our handbook for imposing more restrictions. We impose a lot of restrictions on preferences, um, and they're too restrictive. They're they're too restrictive. Okay, now kind of a footnote on that is somebody else. Um, that's kind of state of the art. Uh, Don Brown and Rosa Matskin uh, did work that overcame Sonenshine. And what did they do? Like, th is Sonenshine Shine wrong? No. What they did is they, they gave the observer more data. Sonenshine and Shine gave, only gave him some prices and quantities, and he didn't give him on some data on incomes and endowments. When you add that, you get some more restrictions. Now, how many restrictions do you get? As many Lucas got not? No, you get set restrictions. You get partial identification, leading to ambiguity. There's a connection. So this goes on and, uh, and is active. Okay, then, so then here's the final thing. So, so, so I just want to conclude by this. Say, so, so, f so before being too hard on Robert Solow, kind of look at that. Um, so you should remember how Lucas in 87 tempered his initial enthusiasm about rational expectations, econometrics, he made fun of likely, he made fun of likely ratio and chi-square specification test that had rejected some of his favorite models. That's Hansen and Singleton. They rejected the, the Lucas acid pricing model, which he, st he still loved, but only parts of it. it. It had a big effect on him. Okay, so those adverse uh, findings pushed Lucas into the wilderness of calibration. So he ended up using, here's, the, here's kind of the puzzle, and it's kind of the beauty of uh, economics and the subject we deal in. Um, and uh, Lucas ended up using calibration procedures that looked a lot like solos. Okay, so I've talked too long. So, so the following. So I, I realized after yesterday that like a, uh, Many of the things I'm talking about, so uh, somebody told me this, I should be downstairs where there's a dinosaur collection because I'm a dinosaur. So, um, so the things that I've described are kind of like, uh, they were new, you know, when, like 
I'm talking about stuff 40 or 50 years ago. They were new, depressing issues. I think some of them are, so, but um, uh, I'm kind of, and I, I realize now in many ways, Lucas was a kind of a dinosaur in terms of what was going on yesterday, in terms of the ambition and, uh, you know, the models that were, are more subtle. And, uh, and I think, uh, I think, uh, I think he'd celebrate that. And I sure do. That's it. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Tom. So I, I think so. Actually, you already mentioned in your slide one is so when we want to think about new research, we should try to preserve the success of old theories. So of course, Lucas or you not, are not dinosaurs. <laughs> that's a that's a simple uh, like response to someone's comments yesterday. <laughs> I don't know who's, who made that. Okay, so now we have a, 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 a you know Q and A session. So you know, please uh, raise your hand so I can pass uh, the, the microphone. Okay, anyone want to have a question? The reason we're obsessive about this case that I have to tell is that Protestants used to speak in English too. I'm teaching, I'm kind of overwhelmed. <laughs> Hi, I, I would like to make your question. I mean, not, not only about the, I mean, I think that was a, a <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I would like to 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 get a, a glimpse about how do you think that is going to be the future. Okay. I mean, I'm By the way, you, by the way, you are a kid, and my rule at NYU, or when I teach, is if you weren't there in the part of the lecture where I covered that, you don't get to ask a question. <laughs> okay. 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 Sorry, keep going. But my question is, how do you see the future of economics? So do you think that the future of economics is just going to be a continuation of the past just by getting into more non-linearity, more heterogeneity, more granularity, more, or, or do you see any kind of breakthrough? I mean, I mean it's, uh, that's, that is a very cheap question, so, so I'm, I'm totally aware of that. But, uh, but I would like to get your view on that. So you're, you're, um, you're wasting your time asking me that question. You're, you, sh you shouldn't be asking a Look, they ask Polk because because I don't know, but 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 there's there's a, there's a, there's a structural reason. They, they, so in 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 1900, somebody asked Poincaré, uh, "Tell me what you think the big discoveries in uh, in uh, uh, science are going to be in the in the in the in the tw 20th century." And he and he he said uh, they're going to be surprises. And you can't predict surprises. So he anticipated information theory. So let me rephrase it. Sorry, I'm not following your example. When Hilbert came with the questions, that was not a forecast. That was a normative <laughs> statement. So what would be for you? The no, I'm going to be. No, I'm going to be. Questions. I'm going to be. I'm going to be sincere. I would ask. Um, I would ask you. I'm interested in, in what you th what you think matters. Um, you know, so, so this is kind of sociology. If you if you kind of study the history of departments, uh, very s very good old people, uh, younger you know, they turned sixty and they got uh, hostile to new ideas, and they 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 didn't uh, serve their departments well in the United States. People I admire. 
And I, so here's, so you put me in the following, says, oh, I wouldn't do that because I'm not like them. First, I'm not smart as they are. And sure, did I like it when Carolyn said, you shouldn't be talking? Yeah, I, I agreed with her, but I didn't like it. So, so th there's a trap. question because <laughs> I'm also so 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 you and you and Bob wrote the 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 uh, macroeconomics after Keynes and then you wrote yeah. this paper which is macroeconomics after Lucas um, so I mean you, you you have a good sense of how the discipline has evolved obviously and what makes a paper influential as opposed to not influential. Yeah. Okay. So what is it that makes a paper? Influence on me. Well, on, on me. Well, yeah, okay. Yes. Let, let's start with you. <laughs> so this is trick. No, this is trick. No, this is, these are, okay, I could talk, I could talk about this in terms of the, the history. So the following. So I don't like this. Never liked it. I never, the top five. That's, that's very destructive. Okay, so if you look at some of Lucas's most influential paper, they're objected by top five. Kittle and Prescott, too. The, the Jet paper came out in Jet. It was rejected. Um, you know, his, you know his, the Lucas and Stokey, which you're building on, is it JM, you know, it's and so on, and so on. And uh, Kittle and Prescott's generally, the, okay. Um, Muth wrote those two papers. Nobody read them. He, d he d was denied tenure after writing those two papers. Um, Muth, John Muth, okay, and so on. So, um, so I guess what I'm saying is um, you just can't look at, sometimes things that are cited a lot, they're cited because they're easy, you know, so anyway, so that's not how I measure. So there are influential things like, you know, Tony's paper on indirect inference, you know, that, that and, and Galland and Talcum, that's interesting because, you know, that's, that's things like, in some sense, those are really narrow papers. So talk about constraints. So, so what's what what, emo, what motivated Tony? Okay, you know he's. I have a theory. I have a theory of it. I'm going to make. This is my fantasy of Tony. He's in some class. His teacher, some Amor Satter gave it. He's saying, "Oh, maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood." So he writes down some model and he says, "I can simulate the model." But I, I, I can't write down a likelihood function. I, I know it exists, but I can't write it down. So then he comes up with this procedure to estimate a model, you know, in a first class way where he can he can compute it and sample from it, but he can't write down a likelihood function. That's very modern, okay? And he figures this out. It's a very narrow and restricted. That's an influential paper on me in a whole bunch of ways. Or, you know, and so on. Or, you know, but are those big breakthroughs? Now you can kind of ask, you know, if you, see a, if you see a big breakthrough in the past, ask yourself, how much of a big breakthrough was it? Even, even Einstein, you know, if you ask, you know, if you look at the ingredients into what he did when he did special relativity, it was set up for him. And he couldn't have done it if he hadn't read, you know, he knew Maxwell, he knew the Michelson-Morley experiments, he knew these measurements of the speed of light, he knew a bunch of stuff, and then he wrote down this. He knew Copernicus. He knew that. You know, Lucas was doing the same thing, and um, you know what I mean. And and you know, somebody who kind of sets out to be a revolutionary, that's kind that's kind of fail. Even you know, Marx was conservative. Marx was he wanted to do something, but he, you know, he's just kind of a mediocre student of Ricardo. But he, he wanted to he wanted to make Ricardo dynamic. He didn't kind of know how to do it. But anyway, and so on. So lots of I have lots of things that are successful are pretty conservative. And they're like I have I have strong prejudice about things you and Greg do, but you don't want to hear them because they're probably, you know. So you know. <laughs> but I, but th but that's kind of turning the tables because. You and Greg do things that, like, that that say Lucas. You, you, you do things that say that Luca, 
Lucas, something, Lucas, Samuelson, Solo, Milton Friedman, Kittle and Prescott all agreed on was wrong. Okay, He's, and it started with Tony Smith. Okay, he said it's wrong. He left something out. That heterogeneity is a big deal for, for understanding a business cycle and for understanding growth. Lucas said it wasn't. Not, not the kind of you're talking about. And um, so that's kind of shaken me up because I respect, first, I, I respect those guys a lot, and they saw some things and looked at some data. So this is the other paper I wanted to give. And it's beautiful because it's got all these formulas. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway, I'd kind of rather illustrate that principle, like how was something done. And that's when Luca, when Luca was asked to talk about what's the Keynesian revolution about. It's not about details. It's not about whether the interest R star is this or that. It's about, it's about method. And that's why I said things behind your back today. They were nicer than yesterday. <laughs> but yeah, that's why, yeah. Can I, so, um, at Prescott at times used to say that if you want to do something new, you have to do it somewhat blind. And I want to think about, is, is there a tension between this and, and conserving the, the, um, the successes of earlier theories? So or do, we, do you just disagree <laughs> with this? Okay, so Prescott, so, so these, are, these are friends. I knew Prescott pretty well. I knew Prescott. Okay, I, I, I knew Prescott when he was doing his tricks. So he was very strategic, and he didn't mean that, and he didn't live by it. So the reason he brought stuff to, there's not too many people who could teach Lucas things or who Lucas would listen to, and Prescott was one of them. And it's kind of amazing because in terms of personality, there's a lesson there. Uh, Lucas was a very eloquent, re well-read person who was if you read read him he writes like a not he writes like a novels he writes beautifully um, and Prescott's b close to illiterate and very inarticulate <laughs> okay and did not write well and he was not well read I mean he read you know you know Lucas went Lucas went to the ballet and pl plays and read serious books and Prescott went to mud r mud wrestling and 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 liked watching roller skating on, you know, women roller skaters on. You don't know what I'm talking about. So, okay. So, but nevertheless, so he liked to present that. But but they talked to each other. Um, it was kind of fascinating. But um, no, Prescott, he brought things. And then he and he did. He would tell pe some people that. He would tell see some people that. And I know what he was thinking. You are not smart enough to learn both uh, stochastic process, time series, and theory. You got to pick, and so, so, Sims is full of crap. Don't read Sims. But he didn't do that to everybody. He did that select. So I saw him do that, and he was very strategic. So he didn't mean it, and he didn't practice it. So if you kind of look at why, did, what did Kittle and Prescott add? So, and Prescott would listen to something. Somebody else who's not quite as inarticulate, but pretty uh, thin, Kittle. Finn Kidlin brought him, okay, okay, if you kind of read, you read Prescott wrote something about um, Ramsey problems, and he said, he said optimal control theory was dead. He wrote this paper you don't want to read. He was dead wrong, and then somehow he met Kidlin, and then they write a paper, it's a beautiful paper, Kidlin brought something. He brought a bunch of stuff about time, anyway. So, he didn't mean it. Now, I heard a faculty member at a distinguished school, really distinguished school, saying that his advice is to tell students, don't read anything that's been written about your subject before. Just start to think of something new. Um, you know, I think that's, and this is a, this is a let's just say it's a top, and ends a small, you know. Uh, I just think it's terrible advice. And particularly in terms of tools. I don't know. Like, look at, look at the papers yesterday. Uh, you, you weren't here, but the papers yesterday were distinguished by um, subtle and sophisticated uh, understandings of what the uh, other authors in the field had done. Like, it starts off with Vigilius. You know, you, it's clear, 
from, learn, from his talk, you learn a lot about what makes some of these other models tick, maybe in ways you didn't think about before. And then it's clear he, they really know what makes it tick, and they make some choices. They make some choices that weren't out of the blue. You know. So tick this off, preserving successes. You know, the, you know, um, and um, same thing goes with John Lucas. Uh, your talk was that. You know, so there, so, so was yours. Uh, you know, we used to have these conferences, and we gave we gave awards afterwards at our party where people were half drunk, and and the, an award that I would have is the the paper with uh, the talk with a. Uh, with the lowest signal to noise ratio in the whole conference, excluding mine. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> this is a wonderful talk. There were some really great signals, but wow. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> you know, got to learn a lot about your bosses and stuff. <laughs> you know, I <laughs> but actually, I brought some of that back in today. <laughs> Sorry. Mr. Pace, I think it's really important what you said about the you know, the, the, the importance of emphasizing, uh, you know, that of emphasizing what, you know, what you preserve when you write a paper, what you preserve about the past, because the students are a little bit obsessed with, you know, doing something new. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this is for the students, you know. <laughs> and, but it, it's equally important to. Well, look what you, so you were living by, you know, you were living by the rule yesterday, showing things. Now, you were doing something, okay, so. <laughs> So you, so the, t so the talks yesterday were vulnerable to Lucas's critique of uh, Kid Leonard Prescott, which Tony kind of said about you. You had, and um, you both had, you backed out some shocks, not, n you know, in a, in a particular way. And in some sense, you, you overfit along a certain dimension. Uh, that's loose language. But so y it, what you did was really creative, and you, uh, you were viewing the data uh, with your model, like really, and you and you got some you got some striking graphs, you know, which, which, uh, which I thought you know, I thought about your graphs a lot, um, and actually I was doing information projection, because I was thinking about well you you mean something different by the Phillips curve than um, than the guys at the Fed. Th they mean or Bob Gordon, and he means something that's interesting. They you mean something, and I was thinking I was doing a projection. I, 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 I'd have to write a program to do it, a Python program. Um, and that, uh, but you know, the, what am I saying? Yes, I agree with you. It's a really important message. Um, I don't know how you convey it. And there's no shortcut. Yeah. Um, show that you have something new, uh, as it is to show that you understand yeah. what was done before. Yeah. So, and, I, and I, you know, this is, I think, what it's important to convey to the students. Yeah, and it's hard. And it's hard because l nowadays, <laughs> there's the, there's institution problem. Nowadays, there's these pre docs, and the and the and the pre docs are they're tilted toward. Um, oh, by the way, do you notice the shots I took at ca causal inference? <laughs> oh, read the paper. Very subtle. They're not. <laughs> oh, they're not that subtle. No, they're not that subtle. <laughs> Carolyn read this paper and she said, "You're so hostile." Mm -hmm. okay, but yeah, Tony. No, I just want to. Uh, maybe this goes into the coffee break too much. Maybe it's better for the coffee break. But there seemed to be a tension between your earlier statement about preserving past successes. And then your, your one example of a revolution in the Copernicus case was exactly that it actually got rid of some past successes. Did what? It, it got rid of some past successes, yeah. right? It didn't match as well on some things. So that there just seems to be a tension between those two yep. statements. Yep. Is, is, okay. That's why, that's why I said this preference for simplicity collides with this rational expectations. Fair enough. You know what I mean? And it's your work... That early work makes you think about that, and and Lucas is uh, you know, and and Lucas is going to be upfront early. He's going to say, "I don't want to match your moments," just like Copernicus didn't, and then, 
And then um, if you read Steven Weinberg's book, he tells you experiments he ignored. And he turned out to be right because they were measurement errors. They were like misleading. So we're always doing that. And, and uh, you were ignoring stuff yesterday, shrewdly. Yeah. But that's why it, that's why, okay. This is one of the themes is this Lucas uh, backed off of rational expectations and kind of metrics. And then, and then, and then the, the, the irony, so I love, you know, life is full of ironies. You know, things like, you know, contradictions. People say one thing when they're young and they do something. The irony is Lucas ended up pr doing theory in a lot of ways that Samuelson solo, doing the applied work in a lot of ways Samuelson solo. And the whole point of the first thing is, okay, there's, an, there's a whole other story there. And Yale's involved. Yale's involved in Chicago. But so, so like, like, here, like here's some giants are involved. Okay. So, and, and there's history. So Keynes writes the general theory. Okay. Uh, and it's all in words. He actually wants it to be quantitative because during the war, he's making all sorts of estimates, of multi but it's out of thin air. And then your predecessors, who you, you know, they said Kumans and Marshak, and, and people at the Coles Commission, they were gonna make it scientific. They were gonna write down stochastic difference equations that implemented Keynes so they could actually do this and do optimal control. That's what they were gonna do. And then uh, solo, so some people doubted it. You know, so like people in my generation, if you wanna do applied work, you had to learn Coles Commission, Yale econometrics and identification the right way. I don't know if that was still going on when you were, you know, the rank and order conditions and stuff. And who refused to do this? Friedman, and he was happy when Koopmans and Marshak left Yale. Just think of that. I mean, he left Chicago. Just think of that. Uh, Samuelson and Solo. And, and they, they kind of had the attitude that we know so much more about the economy than anything that Modigliani can write down in an econometric model that they're doing is ridiculous they kind of agreed with. So Lucas starts out, you know, more sympathetic, you know, one, and th that's the contradiction, he backs up. But like, is that other thing coherent? That's why it's kind of the wilderness. So that's an, in, that has not been resolved. And if you kind of read Lars Hansen's Nobel speech, uh, he, he has subtle, like what do you do when you think, well, how do you do applied work when you think your model is only an approximation? And what do you do when the agents inside your model don't believe it either. And then he gets, he, he gets ex exciting things. He gets what you thought was the market price of risk isn't the market price of risk. It's the market price of something else, model ambiguity. So he loops back to, you know, Don Brown. So these things all, but I'm fantasizing. It's your fault. Great, let's thank Tom again for this uh, great lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So now we are going to have a, a short uh, coffee break. So we are getting back in 12 minutes at uh, 10.50 to start the next session. <laughs>